Rachel. We are back for another podcast episode today in our Ask a Theologian series. And okay, you spent a lot of time reading. <laughs> um, I'm laughing because is that a statement? Is that a question? Is it's, that it's like a observation? Statement, but I was laughing because I was just, I was actually picturing your office as I was saying that. And I mean, the bookshelf that was needed to with, to hold all of the books that you read. But um, through all of your academic journey and also just your own personal reading, like there's a lot of things that you've read. Um, and then obviously scripture itself. And do you ever just read something that just kind of blows your mind in scripture where you're like, I can't believe that happened or I can't oh, believe no. God did that. Yeah. I mean, there's so many different examples like in the Old Testament, we could really camp out there for a hot second of all the wild things that happened there. But then also even when Jesus walked the earth, like so many healings, so many miracles, so many just like supernatural encounters, um, which are incredible and obviously a huge demonstration of God's power. But I'm curious, whenever you're reading those, does it ever trip you up with something that you're going through today or as you're processing something that you're really waiting on God for in your own life? Or do you ever just say like in your brain even, I really wish I could have like been there for that or I could see something like that or witness. Yeah, there's a funny there's a funny one. I was recently reading about um, Balaam's donkey. You know, that's that's a that's a funny one, y'all. Balaam's donkey. For those of us who may are a little less familiar with this, can yeah, you give us a, yeah, Balaam, a short summary? Yeah, Balaam's gone on this road, and there's been this warning that God's given him. Okay. And the and the guy is like, you know, he's all caught up on like, what do I do? What do I not do? And he's going about to give this prophecy, and Balaam's donkey is on this road, and Balaam's donkey sees an angel of the Lord is on the road. And basically, the donkey can see it, but Balaam can't. And so Balaam's donkey is like, if, I, if we keep going, the angel of the Lord, he's going to smite all of us. Like, the sword is coming on all of our heads, right? right? And the donkey refuses to go. So here's Balaam gets mad at the donkey. <laughs> and he's like getting, you know, and then in this wild scene, the donkey talks. God opens the mouth of the donkey. And and this is my paraphrase, but like, I think. Like in Shrek? <laughs> like in Shrek. Y'all, I'm telling you, every narrative is somehow connected to biblical narrative. It really is. It really is. This is just a side project of mine, but I actually do think that the animals in Eden prior to the fall could talk. But that's a whole side note. That is a whole side note. I actually think Balaam's donkey is a good example of why I think that they possibly could be. Anyways. I'm trying so hard to keep up with you right now. Okay, I really I say, am. But this is wild. So what is Balaam? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, trust me. Trust me. I will make the connect here. What is happening? I'm, I'm ready for what the What is connect. happening here? I think Bal- Balaam's donkey is like, yo, this is how, this is my translation. This is like the Joel translation of the, of the Old Testament here. Like, like. Yo, Balaam, there's an angel of the Lord on the road, and he's about to whoop you. And instead, you're whooping me. Like, like I'm trying to save your life, right? right? And um, and it's this amazing, but here's like the connect here. Um, there's a real supernatural world that's around us. There's something that Balaam couldn't see that somehow this animal could see. And, and we have in our 21st century post-enlightened, movement, highly scientific, we have tried to separate the supernatural and the, and natural. the, earth, and the natural. Like, yeah. it's, you know, mm-hmm. and here's the deal. Let me just ask you this question. Tell me, the whole Christian faith is built on this truth, that Jesus, who is God himself, was immaculately conceived, lived a perfect life, died on a cross, defeated death through death itself, rose on the sec- on the third day, ascended to the right hand of the Father. Oh, name one thing about that that is not supernatural. Right. That is not cosmic in nature. Yeah, it's wild. It's wild, mm-hmm. right? And so I just think that's one of the things I'm just like, man, okay, Balaam's donkey, like, teaches us a lot. <laughs> it, it does. <laughs> it There's so many examples in Scripture, I think, that are just hard to wrap your head around even just from like a literature standpoint, but then as you're ma- trying to make connections within your faith, that can be difficult to wrap your head around too. And then also too, like I even think about when we're talking about this like kind of element of miracles or supernatural, whatever you want to call it. Like, have you ever had a friend or um, a family member that had like a scary medical event and all of a sudden they're like healed or they're okay or they made it through or whatever you want to call it. And doctors will often say like, 
there's no there's, there's no, no explanation for this like and they'll even say there's no human explanation for right this. there's no scientific explanation so like this was a miracle so we do see glimpses of you know the supernatural coming through or can can we say that is god intervening in those in those moments is it safe to say that yeah i mean so that that brings us to the real big question here um and and you know the the question is on like when we talk about miracles what are we saying um how do we make sense of Old Testament miracles, New Testament yeah. miracles, and is it possible and plausible that miracles are still taking place today? Yeah, can we can we hope for miracles yeah. today? Yeah. Um. So I think so. You know, Shay, one of the things you know about me, we work very closely together, and you've heard me say this before. I really don't like theological dishonesty, which I'm, we are all grateful for. Yes, I'm not a fan of theological dishonesty. What is theological dishonesty? Theological dishonesty is the presentation of a theological view and then straw manning that view and then being like, oh, that's the only view. I'm like, well, that's not the only view. Like, let's just be honest. Let's be charitable. Let's be open to a possibility. This is why I think humility is so incredibly important in how we do theological study. And so in this conversation, I really do want to start with just um, some theological charity and awareness of saying, listen, there are different views on this. I'm going to summarize two of the different views. Um, I'm going to try to give like where they're coming from, from a, from a scriptural standpoint. And I'm going to then um, land where I've personally after many, many years and and seasons of study and changing my mind, like I've gone through it and this is where I where kinda I am today. So this would be where like scholars would differ on like yes. what is okay. Got yeah. It. Okay. So this is where scholars, theologians would say, Oh, um uh yeah, this is this is our view of the super of of miracles. These are the camps of thought that we're in. Okay. Mm-hmm. So the first camp of thought and um and the this camp of thought is called the cessationist view. Um the oh, well hold on, let me start here. Let me start with what the the two camps are the cessationist view and the continuationist view. The cessa- the cessationist view would view that the miracle ceased after the first century so, uh, church. So like after the apostles basically die with the apostles, so did the miraculous. Okay. Okay. And then the continuationist view would say, well, no, miracles still continue. And then the continuationist view gets nuanced in, in different ways. Um, and, and they would get, um, let me start on what both camps are going to agree on. Both camps are going to agree on the death, burial, resurrection, ascension of Christ. So like we should like I, I care about theological triage. I care about keeping primary things primary, secondary things secondary, and tertiary things tertiary. Um, this conversation is secondary or tertiary. This this like this can um, maybe be great conversation to think through. But I want you guys to hear my heart. Like this ought not cause division in the family of God. It's not a make it or break it. It's not a make it or break it thing. It really shouldn't. Be a make it or break it. And I think one of the biggest tragedies that happens is when we take secondary and tertiary issues of theological nature and we elevate them to primary issues Mm -hmm. and it's causing so much division and disunity. And so I want to just be really clear and really um, just like um, emphatic in that what we're going to describe here are secondary and some camps are going to be in tertiary. Like these are not things that um, are going to make or break our Christian faith. And so I think that's really important. And there's believers everywhere that have different differing views on this. And that's Absolutely. okay. Yeah. And that is okay. Right. And my goal and our goal in this is to give you a lot to think about, you know, mm-hmm. to point you to where the scriptures are. And because I have done the study and we've gone kind of through this, I do want you to know where I've landed uh, in this and also know that I, I hold this open handedly. Like I could be wrong. I think I say that a lot, you know, right. like I could be wrong. And Yet, I think I'm convinced of where I am today. Um, so the cessationist view would hold that the miracle ceased after the first century with the apostles of Jesus. Um, and so the one of the primary verses that they would turn to is a verse like 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 8 through 13. Let me read it for you. It says this, that love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes... The partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put aside childish things. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. Now these three remain, 
faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So um, the cessationist uh, position is going to say, it seems pretty clear here that the the miracles, the, the charismatic types of gifts um, are going to come to an end, that they're going to cease. And in fact, both the continuationist view is going to believe the same thing. The big question is when. Mm-hmm. When is it going to come to an end? The, con- the cessationist view, the view that says like miracles ended after the first century, what they do is they're they're building their kind of theological position around the phrase when the perfect comes. So w- this is like the key to this whole thing is what is the perfect? And so this position, I've got very great friends who are scholars that hold to this view. Um, and they would say to me, Joel, um, the perfect is the completion of the canon. So that's one view. Or the, the perfect is spiritual maturity, that when the church grows out of its infancy in the first century to being spiritually mature, that's when these charismatic gifts are no longer necessary. Um, and those are, you know, those are interesting, um, valid points that can be argued textually and scripturally. Um, I am not convinced of that argument. Um, and let me just give a couple reasons of why I'm not. So the cessationist view looks at two uh, Greek verbs, um, kataregeo, which means come to an end, and paumeo, which means to cease. So these two verbs are, um, the cessationist view is going to be like, oh, see, clearly, that is emphatic. It is saying that this thing is going to be done. Like two different verbs to talk about the ceasing of something is making a uh, an argument to say that this should not happen anymore. Now, I, I follow a New Testament scholar, Tom Schreiner, who makes the, who makes the observation in a lot of Greek literature, two words, two different verbs are, can be used, and it's not about emphatic closure, but it's about stylistic difference, right? So I actually kind of think that probably makes more sense. But here's the other kind of question that we want to ask. What is the context of the rest of these verses? So look at in 1 Corinthians 13, 10, it says, when the partial comes to an end, and then 1 Corinthians 13, 12, Paul says, we know in part, but then we're going to know fully. And then this is the biggest one for me because I'm an Old Testament guy, so I'm constantly doing Old Testament, New Testament. The phrase face-to-face is actually an Old Testament echo where God is appearing face-to-face or in relationship with humanity. So the continuationist view, and I'm going to give my, my, uh, what do you call it? I'm going to give my card to you. Yeah, Yeah, like I'm going to let you all know where I land. Mm -hmm. The continuationist's view goes, oh, well, when the perfect comes, it's actually talking about the second coming of Jesus. Which to me kind of makes sense because it's like, oh, when Jesus comes and now we're in the new heavens and the new earth, there's no more need for the charismatic gifts, mm-hmm. right? Because we've got Jesus and we're in the new heavens and the new earth and now sin hasn't marked and marred the world. It's like, oh, so for me, that's kind of where I've landed personally. I, I've landed with the cessationist view and here are a couple of verses that You've talk landed about that. with the... Uh, Sorry, the continuationist yeah. view. Thanks. <laughs> I was Ooh. like, that was your punchline, and I know that's not what you meant to say. Yes, thank you. <laughs> You're yes, That's a lot of work we just did here. <laughs> yes. Um, so John uh, 14, 12 uh, says, Truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And this is Jesus talking. And he will do even greater works than these, because I'm going to the Father. Now, I want to be honest and charitable for the cessationist view. Their view is going to be like, well, what is what is things that are even greater? The cessationist view says, oh, it's the um, it's salvation. It's it's the proclaiming of the gospel mm-hmm. where now because of the church being mobilized, it's at much greater lengths than Jesus could have done individually by himself, right? I'm like, okay, that's interesting. But I think with these other verses, it actually points to um, the, the charismatic, the way that the gospel is invading the earth and the way that God shows his power. Like look at Mark 16, 17, 17 through 18. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they're going to drive out demons. They'll speak in new tongues. They're going to pick up snakes. If they should drink anything deadly, it's not going to harm them. They'll lay hands on the sick and they will get well. These are all kind of charismatic types of things, um, kind of uh, supernatural things. And then Hebrews 2, 3 through 4, I think, is one of the most important ones. How will we escape if we neglect? if we neglect such a great salvation. This salvation had its beginning when it was spoken of by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. At the same time, God also testified by signs and wonders, various miracles and distributions of gifts from the Holy Spirit according to his will. 
Um, and so all those verses to me say, okay, I do believe that God still um, works through miracles. Now, I have a nuanced continuationist view. Okay. And this is my nuanced view. I don't think that the gift of healing is the gift of healing like was in the first century church. Right. Where it seems like Paul could just like literally just be like, I'm going to pray and then lay hands and the person is healed, right? Mm -hmm. Instead, I think what we have now, and this is actually a little bit closer to some cessationists, is that the Holy Spirit is the agent of healing, is the agent of equipping, is the one who determines who gets well and who doesn't get well on this side of eternity. And in that, the Holy Spirit determines in and whom and through the, the Spirit is going to work. And so do we have the gift of healing? I would say probably no. But can God still heal through us, through our obedience and prayer? And that's like, yeah, if, if he so determines to do that. And so, again, the goal here, and actually there's a, a great quote I want to um, share at the very end uh, of this. Um, it's by Craig Keener. He says that in the theology of the Gospels, signs or these types of miracles are foretastes of the kingdom, not its fullness. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? That these things are supposed to draw us into longing for and to see and witness the goodness of the new heavens and the new earth. They are not in and of themselves the goal. They're just evidence of the king who kind of um, is giving these gifts in order to draw us back to him. Okay, so as we're processing this, I'm just thinking about as we're talking about this question, like, do miracles still happen or like, do mir does God still perform miracles today? Um, I feel like that's such a heavy question when you are walking through something heavy, like personally, like that's the breaking point moment where you're needing to see a miracle, you know? And like, I know so many people debate about like the supernatural and all of that stuff, but like when you're at your breaking point moment and you're in desperate need of a miracle, whether that's a prayer request that you've been waiting to see breakthrough in for so long, like to see God move in that would be a miracle or you're struggling in your marriage and to see God move in that would like deem a miracle. Can you speak to that person? And as you're talking about just how, how the Holy Spirit like works in our lives and even just the mystery of God, like we don't, there is an element of mystery here, yeah. maybe something bigger than a, than a mist, an element, but, um, what would you say to that person that feels like they're needing like a personal miracle today? Yeah, I mean, I would, and I would, I would just say that the things that you're longing for and the things that we want are not bad things. They're embedded into our heart because we know that there's something better, that we're longing for the king and his kingdom to come in his fullness. And so sometimes I think what we need to do is to recall a theology of remembrance where we look back and we go, okay, all the things that we long for are on their way. I think it was um, Charles Spurgeon who said that God's never known to be late, right? Like he's never had a delay. Like he's always on time. When he shows up, that is the right timing. Mm -hmm. And so the, um, the cross was the definitive moment of Christ's victory, that, that it was won. And we live in a fractured world broken by sin. And those things are unavoidable. Mm. And so in light of that, I think we have this great gift in knowing that God invites us to pray and to have faith and to believe that he is fully capable of bringing healing, even in the way that we want that healing to look like, whether it's um, a health situation or a relational dynamic or whatever that might look like. And he wants us desperately to be reminded of the fact that he is still the king who sits on the throne and we are the citizens. And in that, if he chooses to withhold healing or to delay in his time, that those things aren't evidence of his neglect or his cruelty. It is evidence that he is seeing something that we in our finite ways cannot see. Mm -hmm. And he is protecting us from something that we cannot even imagine. And those two things are can live in tension, but just because they're in tension doesn't mean that they're not truth. Right. And so I think we have to hold on to that. And we pray with faith and, we, and with confidence and um, and we grieve, but we grieve as those that have hope. I've got a, a friend who just um, yesterday um, posted that his dad had died unexpectedly 
Um, the doctors had given given him an extra uh, over a year to live with this type of cancer that he had. And um, on Good Friday, unexpectedly, got super sick. And then the doctors like his body shutting down. Mm-hmm. It's like how do you how do you how do you live with that? Like, you thought you had a year, now you only have three days, and you know. Um, yeah, it's once that sobering reality of we know that we're not going to be here forever, you know, like we know we're headed towards heaven, but then it's just like a sobering moment where you remember, like, kind of in more color than you do just yeah. a normal ordinary day. Yeah, and I and I think and we did. I prayed. I prayed for healing. I prayed. Okay, Lord, like you're capable. You can heal in the next two days. You know, you can extend his life if you so desire. Mm-hmm. And I think the operative words are, if you so desire. And then trusting, okay, God, you had something else in, in plan here that we can't see, but we do need to believe that it is perf- it is a protection for us. Because when we look at the past faithfulness of God, he has consistently been faithful in all these other areas of our life and throughout the course of human history. So why would he now deviate from that today in this moment of hardship? So what I hear you saying is... It's totally okay for us to still pray for miracles. Yeah. For us to cry out to God and ask for healing and answers and divine intervention and all all of those things. Yeah. It's totally okay to cry out to God and ask for his intervention. And I mean, just, just even the fact that God would work in and throughout our lives is like a miracle in itself. You yeah. know, I would... I would challenge us today to maybe even think about what are we defining as a miracle? Because if we're constantly only looking for the really big things, the big acts of God, and we're only putting those in like this bucket of miracle, then we will skip over the ways that he is absolutely miraculously moving in our lives today. Yeah, we have an obsession with the charismatic miraculous. And to your point, There are acts of miracles that are happening consistently that are mundane and average, Mm -hmm. but they're still miracles. The breath in my lungs right now, the voice coming out of my mouth right now, like the, yeah, just that heart can come, can come alive, can hear the gospel and believe, put their faith in Jesus. That is a miracle, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. One thing that I've been doing um, over the last couple of weeks is a gratitude practice of like every single day, starting my day um, with like five things that I'm grateful for and it's just started me in such a position and a perspective of looking for the things of God in ways that may not be obvious and sometimes it's literally I mean I traveled a bunch last month so recently I wrote like drinking coffee at home in my own mug that is something I'm grateful for today or to be able to show up at work today and use my gifts or to wake up in the morning and read my Bible with my spouse like all of these things that I'm grateful for and when i really look at it i'm like those things are miraculous Mm -hmm. like there are so many wildly sad bad things that happen on the regular it feels like you know like Mm -hmm. the news is super um obvious with all all that's wrong in our fallen state of world and yet when we can shift our perspective even just a little bit i feel like god will show us the everyday miraculous ways that he is moving and i pray that we still go after the big things that we pray for the big things um but that we wouldn't let those things depending on how they go, change how we view God and his goodness and his and his character toward yeah. us, you know, because that would be a shame. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, if I think some people are like, wait a minute, I kind of want to learn more. I feel like I've just been exposed to all this different stuff. Um, I want to give kind of two resources okay. that um, are going to help you theologically. Um, one from a camp that I'm not in, but I think it's the best scholarship on it by a New Testament scholar that I adore. I actually quoted him. Um, I've quoted him in here. Um, and it, the book is small. It's called Spiritual Gifts, and it's by Dr. Tom Schreiner. His son, Patrick, was my doctoral advisor, so um, he's brilliant. And Tom and I, I would, I would actually argue that Tom's a little bit more continuationist than he um, says in, uh, in, he even says it in the book, but the book is called Spiritual Gifts, and it's literally a case for cessationism. And I think Tom does an excellent job of really laying it out. And then the other book, much more, it's like heavier, b- bigger uh, academic, but it's by Craig Keener. It's a two-volume uh, book uh, on miracles. And Keener like actually goes to, to your point like, and says, what is, it, what is a miracle? What was it in the ancient world? What is it today? And goes through uh, verifiable scientific evidence for those moments where doctors are like, there is no other explanation for this. Um, and he gives a case for the place for biblical miracles today. And... Um, 
that was incredibly helpful for me. Would you say there's also a camp of people that say, I don't know what I think? Sure. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> They're like, I don't know if I want to commit to this. Yeah. yeah. I'm like in the research phase. I'm listening, but like, I don't know if I feel one way or another. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and remember, like, regardless of where you land, we're still part of God's family. Totally. You know? I've heard Lisa say before, we're not going to tell you what to think. We're going to give you a lot to think about. And so I hope that today's episode has given you, wherever you're listening, a lot to think about. And just know that Joel and I are cheering for you. And we'll see you next time.